The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, T. Rowe, Price Australia Limited, ABN 136206689589, AFSL 5032741, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome listeners, as we embark on an exhilarating journey into the world of impact investing. I'm your host, Karen McLeod, and I'm thrilled to guide you through this four-part series where we'll explore the dynamic landscape of finance with a conscience. It's more than just numbers on a spreadsheet. It's about driving change and shaping a future where prosperity knows no bounds. So join me on this exhilarating journey as we explore how finance meets purpose. Investing used to be just about making a meaningful return on your investment. But what if your investment could not only deliver a return on your investment, but also do more good, both environmentally and socially, for the world we all live in? The opportunities now to own quality businesses that have the potential to create a positive impact on society and the planet are broader than they have ever been. T. Rowe Price is a premier global asset management organisation actively investing in opportunities to help people thrive in an evolving world. By understanding clients' needs and delivering timely, actionable insights and solutions, we can help them navigate change and achieve better outcomes. Okay, so welcome. Here we are for the fourth and final episode of Impact Investing. And our two guests today are Hari Balakrishna from T. Rowe Price. And we also have joining us uh, Chris Lang from Ethical Choice Investments. Chris has been an advisor specializing in ethical and impact investing for the last six years. Welcome to both our guests. Pleasure to be here, Karen. So this evening, thank you so much for joining us in this final episode, we'll be discussing how impact investing and environment investing are not one and the same. We'll dive into some different areas that clients can actually invest in and have a positive impact with. Uh, We'll also be talking about which clients might be likely to be interested in an area and also why impact investing has become more investable. So firstly, I'll speak uh, with you firstly, Chris, if I may. Can you describe, would you say, in your experience, how has impact investing become more investable? Why is it you can invest more in areas that will provide positive impact? Partly because it's become a thing that people are aware of. Um, so it's something that people know of and are seeking out now. But partly uh, as well, the reporting's gotten better so that we can actually uh, look deeper into com- companies and rather than just getting financial data. Um, there are sustainability reports that come from companies and there are th- independent third-party tools that um, look in depth at companies and see uh, what they're doing well and what they're not doing so well and report on that. So with more information, we're able to to make better decisions on behalf of our clients. What would you say, Hari? Why do you think this has sort of evolved to where it is now in your view? So, Karen, just I'd say a couple of things. So firstly, just in terms of what impact investing does, I think the realisation that mobilising capital to solving for the sustainable development goals and just the funding gaps that just get, you know, ever and ever wider. You know, what started with like a three trillion funding gap pre COVID is now close to like a five trillion dollar funding gap a year. Um, I think the idea that mobilizing capital in that direction has both sustainability um, you know, outcomes that are positive, um, but importantly participating in companies that provide solutions to driving the sustainability outcomes can result in in superior financial outcomes as well. I think that's one part of it. And then the second part of it that, you know, I think I'm, you know, very excited about is I think as as we spoke about in in in, a, in um the, the prior episode, just the advent of a lot of funds that just kind of slap labels uh, on on kind of what they do um without a lot of thought in terms of the link between dollars invested and the outcomes. And I think just a growing realization from regulators, from clients, from advisors that, you know, more than ever, we need funds where the link between the dollars invested and the outcome generated needs to be measured, reported on, and you know there needs to be a real impact from those dollars invested. And I think that's the other area that impact investing really helps to solve for, right? So effectively solves a lot of the greenwashing risk 
as well as an outcome measurement aspect as well. So if I'm an investor, what what actually is an impact? How would you describe an impact company, Hari? While I've got you, what what is an impact company? What does it look like and how is it intentional? Yeah, so the, the, the way that, you know, we would define impact, Karen, is we'd look at, um, you know, from an impact perspective, you know, really three different, you know, aspects, right? So the first thing is materiality of revenue exposure. So is this company providing a service, a solution, or a product that is helping solve for a social or environmental goal where that solution is basically the majority of its revenues, right? So in our case, we define it as greater than 50% of revenues aligned with a positive impact activity. Uh, the second thing we needs to be able to do is we need to be able to measure the impact, right? So if you take an example, you know, one of our holdings, um, you know, is, is a company called New Bank, uh, you know, listed in Latin America. Um, this is basically a company that uh, enables financial inclusion. It's one of the world's largest digital blanking, uh, banking platforms. And, 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 the, and the way it really does that is, you know, working with the underbanked uh, or the unbanked in the system and bringing them into the mainstream of the financial um, system, right? So in, in New Bank's case, you know, we estimate close to 100% of their revenues aligned with delivering financial inclusion. And then on the second aspect of impact, which is we want to measure, uh, you know, what the impact actually is, you know, we we look at the fact that six close to 6 million people were brought in the financial system for the first time with their first credit or debit card. And we track that metric over time. We, we track, you know, the 75 million or so customers who are provided access to financial services by New Bank. Um, and then the, the other aspect of impact, which you brought up um, yourself, is, is additionality, right? So how can we be additional um, through our investments? And that really happens on, on sort of two dimensions, right? And so, you know, just, just to level set everyone, additionality is about making a difference to the impact in a positive way. So as, as, um, as a fund manager, working with our portfolio companies to ensure that our clients' money is actually delivering real-world impact, right? And, and the way we do that is by encouraging, influencing, working with uh, companies and having strategic engagements on progressing that impact agendas. So, you know, how can we make a difference, essentially, you know, to the impact being delivered? There's also other tools like, you know, proxy voting and things like that, but primarily it is through engaging directly and partnering with our portfolio companies to drive that impact. So just in a nutshell, impact's really about every company needs to have a positive environmental or social impact in the world uh, through the solution product or service it provides alongside a financial return. Mm, great summary there, Hari. Um, and Chris, what, do, what about you? What, what would you say? How do you describe an impact company to say to a client? Because Hari's explanation is obviously quite a complicated one. Is there something that that you would suggest advisors might use to describe what an impact company looks like in a in a sh- short and simple way? Uh, yeah, I guess short and simple. There's yeah, I'd probably have three measures of an impact company as well. Um, one is impact. Um, what's that company doing, and um, uh, is it a positive impact? Uh, measurability again, um, align, in line with what Hari said. Uh, if you can't measure or see that impact, then there's not really any indication that it's there. So it needs to be something that um, you can be sure is more than just talk from the company. Um, and intentionality. So uh, this is probably uh, slightly different to what Harry was talking about, but I think the intentionality is really key, which is, um, is the impact that they're having a core part of that company? Is that um, front and center one of their goals or is it just kind of a business as usual and uh, nothing particularly special for the sector that they're in um, so to have an impact I, I kind of th- feel like these companies need to be um, out in front of the norm um, doing new things um, and uh, doing things in a way that will um, potentially cause uh, change to how those other carbon sector Operate. That's an interesting point, actually, Chris. So, you, yeah, being out in front is a good point and doing something that's different. Um, maybe we'll just start now, Chris, with you just talking about, like, to, to paint a picture for those listening, like, obviously, impact investing can cover many different types. It, it may be focused on environmental outcomes, health imp- outcomes, technology, quality of life. Are there some examples of impact investing that you like to use with your clients to just describe to them the positive impact they can have uh, and the types of investments they can make in this sector? Yeah, so um, the types of uh, 
uh, impacts can be in, in two major areas. So environmental, as you mentioned, and, and social. So environmental might be around um, climate, um, renewables, um, uh, and environment, um, bio credits, uh, and social could be things around uh, the essentials of life, um, so housing, health, education, and it could also be around human empowerment. So I think Harry touched on this earlier, which um, probably things that we take for granted in the areas that we live, but um, things like access to banking and financial services, access to internet, things that uh, while we might have a lot of access to those, they can be really empowering for people who are from uh, developing countries um, where maybe that access isn't uh, a given and it can really, really improve people's lives. Mm, that's true, actually. And what about from your perspective, Hari, as a portfolio manager, what are the examples of impact investing sort of that you see within your portfolio and how is that evolving um, over time? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, yeah, and, and, and firstly, Karen, you know, when we look for impact companies, you know, we have a dual mandate, right? So our mandate is to maximize the impact and maximize financial performance. So, you know, very similar to what, you know, Chris said, you know, when we're looking for companies, when we're looking for the materiality, we are also looking for the best in class impact companies. To Chris's point, I think it's really important that companies need to be able to demonstrate something out of the ordinary in terms of, um, you know, special impact, a special product, trailblaze, you know, uh, you know, either, you know, whether it's financial inclusion or providing healthcare or, or reducing greenhouse gases. So, um, with that, with that in mind, you know, the the way we define impact is, you know, we're quite transparent about um, the activities that qualifies impact and ones that don't. Um, and so, primarily, what we look for are companies that reduce greenhouse gases. So, those would be not just renewable energy companies, because I think there's much more impact than renewables, uh, but also companies enabling uh, energy efficient solutions. So, when you think about all these data centers that are get, getting built out in the world today, uh, you know, for fulfilling AI demands cooling the data centers and preventing emissions from those becomes a big part of, um, you know, thesis. So we own a company like Crane Technologies that would that would provide a service like that. Uh, we would invest in companies that promote healthy ecosystems, so enabling an improvement in air quality, water quality, or land quality. Circular economy stocks, so companies that, you know, reduce manufacturing waste or companies that would take a product, you know, so, so like, for example, we own a company called Trex. They take plastic out of landfill, it's one of the companies that has a leading chemical process. It needs to convert plastic out of landfill into decking solutions, which which serves as a building material and, and an infinitely recyclable uh, circular loop. And then in the social side, I'd say companies that promote financial inclusion, like New Bank, uh, you know, would be good examples. Uh, healthcare tends to be a really important, uh, you know, part of our framework as well. But again, with healthcare, to Chris's point, you know, not every healthcare company is an impact company. We've got to make sure that the companies that we invest in in some way, shape, or form, or either improving access to healthcare or reducing the cost of really innovative healthcare, or just genuinely have truly groundbreaking solutions, you know, for for sort of patient therapies. Uh, and then you have also invest in things that you know, like like cybersecurity, uh, you know, personal mental fitness, sustainable in smart cities as well, um, in terms of what we do. But across environmental and social dimensions, those would be a flavor of the kind of activities that we would be looking for. And again, just as a reminder, we would look only for companies that have the overwhelming majority of their revenues aligned with delivering solutions to uh, driving those activities. Such a breadth of uh, different investment opportunities. Um, and of course, I all focus particularly in the, the equity space. And I know that impact investment companies can be, um, you can have impact investments, I suppose, for clients, Chris, in uh, other asset classes. Maybe you want to just describe how you sort of explain to clients how they can invest in impact in in other sectors um, and to build a portfolio that really suits their overall needs. Is that something you'd like to comment on? Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, generally when we think of impact um, companies, we think of um, companies, um, but there are uh, other options like um, social impact bonds. Um, so these are bonds that are more aligned with fixed interest where – there might be an issue that needs solving that the government identifies, and it's normally a government, but it could be a not-for-profit or a um, NGO. But it, it could be something along the lines of um, uh, scarcity of social housing um, uh, or um, mental health management, and it's something that costs the government or, or that organisation a lot of money to um, to address. Um, 
And so they can put that out to tender in a way. And, and if there's a company out there that feels that they can do a better job than uh, the government, then that would save the government um, potentially millions uh, over the five or 10 years that they choose to run a program. Um, so if there's a program that's set up, uh, a social impact bond can um, be a way for a uh, non-government organization to directly address this um, failing in society or, or in the environment. Um, and share in the savings that the government uh, creates from doing that well. Mm. Yeah, it does seem it does seem that way, doesn't it? It seems that impact investing is seeing the significant growth worldwide because investors are sort of are looking for ways to provide, uh, as Hari said before, financial capital to some of those social and environmental solutions that they want to see, as well as receiving obviously competitive return for that. And then the regulatory environment has really provided clearer guidelines and there's more confidence in the sector. So it means more expansion in the different investments investors can get exposure to, which um, would you say, Chris, has been the case over the last six years while you've been in this sector? Yeah, it's definitely um, grown and expanded. Um, It's also started filtering down. So it used to be previously that it was only wholesale investors and um, uh, investment funds that were able to access these sorts of investments. Um, it might be because of scale. It might be sort of half million dollars of entry, which um, tends to knock out your um, standard mum and dad investor. Um, but uh, we're seeing a lot of different ways where people can now start to access and and support these sorts of investments um, hmm. at a more retail level. At a more retail level. Harry, about, what about from your perspective, how would you describe the way the impact investment sector is evolving, given this is your specialisation also? Well, look, I'd say on, on a few different dimensions there, Karen, I agree with Chris. You know, one is, I think, you know, I think just at a very high level, the number of asset classes that are offering impact investments have broadened significantly, right? So if you think about the roots of impact investing, um, you know, as, as Chris said, you know, a lot of it started in kind of social impact bonds, kind of morphed into you know social impact companies on the on the private side, environmental impact companies on the private side, and now I think you can see a lot more cases um, and applications in listed equities, um, listed credit, green bonds, you know, um, blue bonds, you know, things like that. So what what I'd say is probably the biggest evolution that I have seen in the last. Certainly, I can speak for the listed equity space. Um, the biggest evolution I'd say has happened across three dimensions, right? So the first one is just the sheer availability of funds like this to the end retail investor, right? As Chris said previously, this was the purview of, you know, high net worth individuals and, you know, wholesale investors only. So I think that's, that's been a great outcome that retail investors can, can vote, uh, you know, with their feet and, and invest in these funds if they want to. The second um, dimension that I would say is just greater guidance on how to deliver impact in listed equities and, and just a greater clarification of a lot of these frameworks. So that what, you know, Chris and I have spoken about, you know, the intentionality, the measurability, the, the materiality and things like that. Uh, a lot of it has been, you know, coded into frameworks by organizations like the Global Impact Investing Network, which is one of the leading uh, collective bodies for impact investors uh, around the world. Um, and then the third thing that I would say, which I think is probably the most um you know, pleasing thing to see is I think at the corporate level, um, just a much greater focus on product sustainability, which I think is driving behavioral change in corporates. Now it's slow, right? There's a, there's a very long way to go on a lot of these dimensions. So please don't take this as like everything's sorted out. Um, it's it's slow progress, but it's just very pleasing to see progress none the, nonetheless. You know, we've seen examples of, you know, companies accelerating, say, renewable deployments or if we've got a company providing, um, let's say, green hydrogen solution as part of like a wider remit of solutions, accelerating the green hydrogen solution, again, you know, managers like us, you know, it's incumbent on us with that additionality responsibility to drive that impact agenda and have those kind of conversations with these companies. That um, those would be the three big developments, I would say. And I think all of it is leading to, again, I'm going to say improving, not improved, because there's still a long way to go, improving. Um, you know, ability for us to capture data, to to measure outcomes, uh, and just generally be more transparent. You know, with the end, end investor, uh, which you know, given that this is an area, you know, where I think historically there just hasn't been enough, um, you know, data and 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 sort of measurability constructs to be fully transparent on. 
Such an exciting way forward, I think. And just to reassure, I suppose, advisors that are listening, like how do you ensure that your impact investments are indeed delivering both the social and environmental benefits and impact you're looking for and financial returns? A bit a bit about the process that impact investors should know about. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I'd say, you know, the financial side hopefully is, is pretty straightforward, right, in the sense of people can track – um, the performance of a fund, right? And so that's that's probably the, the easiest way to look at, you know, how, how funds like these would perform. Now, the last couple of years have actually been a relative to a broad, you know, because this is a nascent asset class, certainly in the listed equity space, um, there really hasn't been like a, you know, Morningstar or Looper category, you know, for impact or like, or, or an impact benchmark that's been launched, right? And so in the absence of that, um, you know, a lot of impact managers have just used like a broad, you know, equity benchmark. And, um, you know, we invest because of the, you know, the definition of what impact is. And, you know, we went through sort of how rigorous that is. You know, we need to be able to find material exposure to a positive impact activity. It needs to be measurable. We need to be able to make a difference, you know, to the impact, so on and so forth. So we find only about 400 or 500 companies in the growth global index uh, out of roughly 3,000 or so companies that could even potentially get close to qualifying as as impact investment. So the bar is is pretty high. Um, so what it means is you can end up with performance outcomes that are quite different you know, to the benchmark, particularly when you have, you know, energy that was driving markets in 2022, and you, we wouldn't be invested in you know fossil fuels, for example, or when you have um, the mag, the magnificent seven sort of you know having narrow leadership that we've seen really for the last 18 months or so. Um, but in terms of process, what I'd say there is, you know, taking that universe of 400 500 companies really holding into the measurement process. So we actually use a process we borrowed from the impact management project, which is um, you know, widely accepted framework on impact measurement, which is called the five dimensions of impact. So we run every stock through that five dimensions of impact process. You know, we work out what the strategic goal of the impact is, who is getting affected. So we identify the target. We identify the, the impact risks, you know, what are the risks to the impact not getting delivered. And then we also look at the scale and the depth of the impact. So what is the impact currently being delivered, what is the change in impact, so on and so forth. Uh, and then you know, we'd run traditional financial analysis on these stocks as well, right? So can we, because of the solution this company is delivering, can we see a difference in what we think the earnings cash flow returns of these companies are going to be five years out uh, compared to market expectations? And we value these on price to free cash flow that have the best risk adjusted return across both impact and financial uh, dimensions. Um, so to give you an example, you know, one of the companies we're invested in, Danaher, they're a life science tools company. They basically provide a lot of the innovative life science tools that go into healthcare innovation, uh, you know, both, both in biotechs and biopharma. And just the sheer advent of investment in healthcare, um, you know, the sheer innovation we're seeing uh, in, in cancer cures and Alzheimer's and things like that, cell and gene therapy have meant that the fact that a company like this at the leading edge of providing the most innovative uh, tools and solutions to a lot of these uh, healthcare companies to allow them to innovate and bring down the cost of you know really you know life saving drugs you know to the the rest of the population. We find that a company like that actually has a better growth algorithm, right? So we think because of the investment in healthcare and because of the focus on impact, we think this is a company that will have over the next decade a much better growth algorithm than it did in the prior decade, right? So that's the link between the impact and the and the, the sort of financial uh, outcomes. That was so very well explained. Thank you so much for that, Hari. Just so uh, reassuring for advisors listening that you have such a thorough process, both for the financial and the impact assessment. What about you, Chris? How do you how do you explain to your clients like that? Is there a perception that they might have about you know what is risk and reward balanced? When they do impact investing versus traditional investments, do you do you have that conversation about how they're going to vary from benchmark? How does how does that work when you're advising clients, Chris? Um, I think Harry hit it on the head when uh, he talked about the companies that he's looking at uh, tend to be um, looking into innovative new areas and, and finding solutions to issues that are out there. And I guess one of the points that I like to make is that if there's a company that's doing a really good job of um, solving an issue that no one else is, that's probably going to be a successful company. Um, there's a, there's every chance that that's going to do better than your, your standard sort of healthcare company, if it was a healthcare company doing new things. Um, so, 
Yes, I think, yeah, well said, Chris. I think you're right. Having that extra information to make those decisions is helping them select the most appropriate companies for the portfolio. Yeah. What about the kinds of clients, Chris, that you're seeing? Do you notice that there's any um, certain demographics of your clients that are interested, like are younger clients leaning towards more environmental causes or focusing more on healthcare or climate change solutions? How are you, or older clients focused on different sorts of investments? How do you engage with them to find out what sort of impact investments are best for them? Yeah, look, it's it's really just the same as any other ethical investing interest. You have the conversation with that client. Um, you find out what they're interested in, um, what the areas are that are important to them uh, and, and what sort of solutions are going to be um, acceptable for them uh, to seek out and, and support. Um, but to be honest, my personal experience is that um, the majority of clients just want to have an impact. Um, they might feel more comfortable or more focused on uh, the environment or, or the social side of things. Um, climate change can be a big one for people across all age, age ranges, but um, I would say the majority of my clients just want to have an impact and want to see that their money is um, uh, being a force for change um, and exactly uh, which of those positive change areas that they're seeking out is less important than knowing that um, – that money's been really well allocated and, and used. That's actually quite good to know. So don't don't generalise between the different demographics. Just ask the questions and make sure you sort of foster that engagement with them so that they are getting the right investments for their needs, I suppose. Um, what about you, Hari? Would you say, do you pay any heed to what the different demographics are looking for and their different preferences or are you just looking yeah, to – over to you, Hari. You sure can. I mean, so, you know, we – you know, we, we definitely want to, you know, provide solutions, right, you know, for, for what our clients are looking for. So there's there's no question that, as, as Chris said, you know, different clients will have different needs and requirements. Um, at a broad brush, I guess what we're trying to do is, um, you know, we're trying to offer our clients the ability to have both an environmental and a social impact, you know, across um, those dimensions. Uh, for, for select clients who, you know, who, who want, you know, a particular area more than others, right? You know, and this is this tends to happen more on the institutional side. Um, if people want to carve out, um, you know, say more of the environmental side of the social side, you know, that's certainly something you know we we're you know willing and, and prepared to do uh, in terms of a customized solution. Um, but generally, we find um, clients, you know, want to have that that sort of broad impact across both kind of environmental and, and social dimensions. And as Chris said, they they want to have it, they want to have an impact. Um, our hope is that by providing something that is, you know, truly authentic, uh, accountable, you know, to, to our clients, you know, our hope is, you know, clients will be discerning between funds that do that and, and, and funds that don't uh, in, in terms of that authenticity of, of trying to offer what we do. I think that's, yeah, it's really good to know that you've got that ability to tailor the approach depending on what the client's needs are. And would you also say that at the moment there is a bit of a merger happening between impact that's providing both environmental and social outcomes that's coming together with a sustainability like outcome as well that they're providing those dual impacts? How does that work in the portfolio, Hari? Yeah, it's pretty rare, Karen, to find something that is you know like a hundred percent linked to an environmental outcome and a hundred percent linked to a social outcome because as you know, generally we're looking for pure play exposure, you know, to those themes that I spoke to you earlier about, right, in terms of reducing greenhouse gases. Now, obviously a company, so, you know, you take the company that I explained, you know, the example I gave earlier, train technologies, or you look at a water, you know, some of the water companies were invested in like, um, you know, Mueller Water, um, they, they will provide an environmental solution in train's case, reducing greenhouse gases, or in Mueller's case, enabling water infrastructure. Um, that tends to be effectively what they do. So it's pretty rare that a company like Crane will do that and then also provide healthcare or financial inclusion, right? So generally, we'll have a pure play company for those. But generally, what we find is the companies that provide a positive impact activity, they just tend to be more thoughtful about sustainability issues more broadly, right? So maybe they don't have a social impact, but they certainly will treat their employees better. Or they'll be more thoughtful about social issues in general. Um, in terms of dealing with their customers and suppliers and things like that. So that's what we generally find. But um, to directly answer your question, it's pretty rare to find a company doing both um, at the same time. Okay, good to note. I think in the I think in the bond space, I think that's increasingly perhaps more common than in the equity space. But um, Chris, what about you? Do you do you see that that's um, something of interest from your clients? That sort of merged environmental and 
and social overlap. Yeah, I, I think so. I think um, I think when you step back a little bit, you can actually see that a lot of these things are quite interlinked. So a really good example is um, uh, renewables. So um, obviously, uh, clean energy is um, an environmental impact. It reduces carbon emissions. It's uh, really positive for the planet, but it also reduces the cost of power and um, and that has social benefits. Um, another example might be, well, overpopulation uh, is a big impact on the environment. And probably one of the best ways to reduce uh, birth rates is to educate young women. And uh, th- that has an impact socially and improves the lives of those women and, and the societies that they're in. But it also has an impact on the environment and longer term um, can be beneficial for the environment as well. So it's it's kind of hard to say on a broader scale that this is just something that's uh, environmentally focused or just something that's socially focused because these things tend to be interlinked. Yes. They're great examples. Thank you for sharing those. Well, just before we wind up, I just would encourage those listening to really understand that that as you've both described so beautifully, impact is you know, touching on so many sectors of society beyond traditional environmental causes. So they can invest with impact to solve for a variety of needs um, and for a variety of different client requirements. So it's quite compelling, obviously, to make positive change while generating a great financial return. Is there anything you'd both like to to summarize just um, for those listeners in talking about the different types of impact and how it, it has become um, more an investable space for those listening, Kari, would you like to go first? Sure. I mean, I, I guess if I were to summarize, you know, how I think about impact, you know, I, I'd summarize by saying that I couldn't be more excited about the prospects, you know, for companies delivering impact. Right. So when you think about the environmental issues we face, you think about the social issues we face. Um, you know, a lot of these are getting exacerbated, right, as as time kind of goes on. So the need is greater than ever to find companies that provide, you know, these solutions for better environmental and social outcomes. And you know, when I think about the collection of equities we own in the portfolio, more so than ever, we just find you know, a lot of these companies are having better product cycles or having greater demand from the end you know customers, um, or they're having um, just a you know and and from an impact perspective, just having a greater and greater impact. And so when we think about the the, the collective of the portfolio, uh, and I think about the next you know decade, couple of decades, um, I think this is a really fertile ground, you know, for clients, you know, to think about allocating, um, you know, their, their money to in terms of both having that impact. Uh, and, and equally importantly, you know, if you believe that these are the companies having, you know, better fundamentals, um, you know, than a lot of companies in the index, you know, over time, good absolute returns as well. How exciting. What about you, Chris? Tell us the future. <laughs> uh, well, I guess the way I see it is that um, if you've got the choice between a, a sort of standard um investment that um, has a financial return or an impact-focused investment which has a similar uh, return but also improves the um, our planet and our society, then it's really a bit of a no-brainer. Why wouldn't you choose the one that has those external benefits as well as just the financial benefit? I really do see uh, impact investing growing because it's just a total no-brainer. Why wouldn't you? Yes, so well said, Chris, very simply, and Hari too. Thank you so much, both. Um, Such a delightful um, episode. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to hear both of your insights this evening. Thank you. That was was pretty, uh, really enjoyed that and and pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Really. Pleasure. 